All the preparations have been made for Jamaicans to head to the polls on Thursday, despite a steady increase in COVID-19 cases. US President Donald Trump visited the city of Kenosha on Tuesday, expressing support for law enforcement after the police shooting of a black man. The Chinese Foreign Ministry has denied reports that a soldier was killed on the China-India border in recent days. From the headquarters of Teresa English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South, I'm Katrina Goss. Jamaican Prime Minister Andrew Holness confirmed that polls will open on Thursday for the general elections amidst a steady increase in COVID-19 cases. Holness called the election three weeks ago and justified his decision by stating that citizens need a new government despite the global health crisis. People who are infected with COVID-19 will be allowed to vote between 4pm and 5pm. However, to do so, they must wear a mask, face shield, gloves and disposable gown. An hour later, at 6pm, people held in quarantine as suspected cases, as well as confirmed patients' contacts, will also be able to vote. The Electoral Office of Jamaica informed that citizens will elect 63 parliamentarians, with the main contenders being representatives of the ruling Jamaica Labour Party and the opposition People's National Party. And Jamaica's Ministry of Health and Wellness confirmed the deaths of three people due to COVID-19 this Wednesday. Authorities also reported a total of 224 new coronavirus cases confirmed over the last 24 hours. The latest figures bring the total number of cases reported on the island to 2,683, while the death toll stands at 24. As the number of cases continues to rise, the ministry has urged all citizens to take the necessary precautions in order, order to avoid the spread of the virus. Cuban health authorities offered an update on COVID-19 cases this Wednesday. 61 people were diagnosed with COVID-19 in our country yesterday. With this number of samples and number of confirmed cases, we have conducted a total of 408,727 tests and 4,126 people have been diagnosed with COVID-19 in our country which represents 1.01 percent. And the National Director for Epidemiology also reported a further three COVID-19 related fatalities in the past 24 hours. We inform and regret the death of three people yesterday, which brings the total to 98 people who have passed away due to COVID-19 in our country, which represents a case fatality rate of 2.37 percent. And Dr. Duran also reported on the total number of people who have recovered from the coronavirus. And yesterday, a positive note among the data, as there were 63 discharges, a little bit more than the number of cases that were confirmed and that were admitted yesterday. With these 63 people giving the all clear yesterday, a total of 3,458 people have recovered from this disease. The director of the Pan American Health Organization has stressed that the Americas have registered the highest number of health workers infected with COVID-19 in the world. Our data shows that nearly 570,000 health workers across our region have fallen ill and more than 2,500 have succumbed to the virus. Based on this data, to date, we have the highest number of healthcare workers infected in the world. In Paraguay, the increasing numbers of COVID-19 infections are threatening to spark the collapse of the health system during the second week of September. Meanwhile, the number of deaths could reach 1,000. We have more in the following report. Pastor Perez works at the Laboratory of Scientific and Applied Computing in the National University of Asunción. He reported that the confirmed cases double every two days and the number of deaths could triple in the next 15. This is an estimated value for mid-September. 
that the infections could rise to 750 to 1,000 cases. I repeat, the purpose of always trying to anticipate this kind of situation is, on one hand, to advise the authorities that they have to make a decision so that they can instruct on measures to try and slow the pandemic and at the same time to promote citizenship awareness on this issue. The team of experts from the National University of Asuncion believe that if there are no changes in social behavior to stop contagion, the increase in the number of confirmed cases will follow this trend. For mid-September, the forecast shows a total of confirmed cases between 30,000 and 40,000 cases. That is not an isolated value that we are doing with the methods we are using. Also, in other countries, they are talking about this kind of figures. Official reports show that 55% of the health services dedicated to treat COVID-19 are being used. The Paraguayan Doctors' Association foresees the imminent collapse of these services. A 75% use of hospital services, probably all the capacities will be used quickly. I think that if things do not improve, if there is no decrease in cases, we could have a collapse by next week. The National Union of Doctors of Paraguay expressed its concern about the lack of testing, which could create better conditions to treat the disease. In addition, they claim that the biosecurity supplies must reach all the health personnel. We are concerned as a union because of the small numbers of tests being made. There is no guaranteed quantity. Some of the chemical supplies are not available. The testing is always delayed due to a lack of supplies. And what we request is to guarantee the testing at a national level. 85% of the total deaths from COVID-19 in Paraguay have happened in the last month. Currently, 620 doctors are infected and in isolation. Three of them have died from the disease. In addition, the authorities admitted that Paraguay is a few weeks away from reaching the peak of the pandemic. Osvaldo Sayas, Telesur Asunción. U.S. President Donald Trump visited the city of Kenosha, Wisconsin State on Tuesday, where he expressed his support for law enforcement after the police shooting of a black man sparked widespread protests. Trump blamed domestic terror for the destruction in the Midwestern city. Kenosha saw days of violence after a police officer shot Jacob Black Blake in the back seven times on August 23rd, leaving him paralyzed. The president is pushing a strong law and order message as he ramps up his discourse against democratic state authorities. Meanwhile, his rival for the presidency, Joe Biden, has accused Trump of stoking racial division, stressing he's fanning the flames rather than fighting them. Trump has met with protests against his visit to the city. Meanwhile, the family of Jacob Blake stressed that they were focusing on community building and held a Justice for Jacob rally that offered resources often lacking in the African-American community, photo registration and COVID-19 testing. Despite the tensions, the latest opinion polls show Trump is narrowing Biden's lead ahead of the November election. There's so much hate running rampant in this country and it kills me. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. You know, I don't want this for my children. I don't want this for, for our country. Make America great again? What? When was this country ever great for us as black people? When? You know, never. Russia has expressed strong support for Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko following weeks of Western-backed opposition protests. Moscow recognized the results of the elections in which the Belarusian leader won a sixth term and has since been stepping up official contacts and vowing to defend the alliance with its neighbor in the face of Western attacks. The two governments have announced high-level political and military meetings in the coming days. Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Misustin will arrive in Minsk on Thursday to become the most senior Russian official to make a public visit to Belarus since the unrest broke out over the disputed presidential elections on August 9th. Economic aid is likely to top the agenda after the European Union announced sanctions against the country. It was also announced earlier this week that President Vladimir Putin would host Lukashenko in the coming weeks. We will respond firmly to any attempts of those who try to sway the situation in Belarus, those who try to tear away Belarus from Russia by their clumsy flirtations with Minsk for many, many years and undermine the basis of the Union state. 
We think there's no point in meeting the representative of the opposition's coordination council who seeks such contacts unless they have a proper legal basis according to the legislation of Belarus. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson had to defend himself over his mishandling of the coronavirus pandemic in the first session of Prime Minister's questions since the House of Commons returned from its summer break. The leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, accused Johnson of serial incompetence in his response to the pandemic as the Prime Minister dodged questions over when he first became aware of the looming fiasco over the system to decide students' exam results in the summer. The Labour leader called on the PM to get a grip, saying he had wasted the last three months as the country went from crisis to crisis, U-turn to U-turn, when he should have been preparing the UK for a possible resurgence of COVID-19 in the autumn and winter. Johnson, as usual, dismissed his critics and claimed he had moved the country forward. I take full uh, responsibility for everything that has happened under this government uh, throughout my period in office. And actually what has happened so far is that we have succeeded in turning the tide of this pandemic, that it is safe for the workforce of this country to go back to work in a COVID secure way. We want to take this country forward. We're not only getting the pandemic under control, with deaths down, with hospital admissions way, way down. We will continue to tackle it with local lockdowns, with our superlative test and trace. Japan is likely to have a new prime minister within weeks after the ruling Liberal Democratic Party set a rapid timetable for replacing Shinzo Abe following his resignation. In meetings over the weekend, party elders discussed plans to vote on Abe's replacement by the middle of September, with the electorate restricted to members of parliament and heads of regional party chapters. A speedy selection process avoiding a full vote of party members will maximise the influence of Mr Abe and his allies, so increasing the chances of a successor who maintains the policies of Japan's longest-serving leader. Meanwhile, Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihide Suga, a powerful figure in Abe's government, fueled speculation that he would stand with a long blog post about coronavirus that ended with a declaration that he would fulfil his responsibilities with all his power. Suga appears to be the favourite for the September 14th elections. In this national crisis, there must not be a political vacuum. There is not a moment to waste. I would like to continue the work of Chinzo Abe, who poured his spirit and strength into the job, and I am committed to mobilizing all my forces to move forward further. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Hua Changying has stressed that no Indian soldiers have lost their lives on the China-India border in recent days, contrary to reports. The spokesperson made this statement following reports that a Tibetan origin soldier with the Indian Special Forces was killed in a clash on Saturday night. Army commanders from China and India have been meeting for several days for a round of talks to ease tensions in the border area of Pangong Lake in eastern Ladakh. Based on my understanding, no Indian troops lost their lives in conflicts or in the border area in recent days. India's statement says the Indian Army took the so-called preemptive action, thus a Chinese phrase, attempting to hide something makes it more conspicuous. India has made its confession without being pressed, fully proving that this incident once more involves Indian troops illegally crossing the border and provoking first, unilaterally changing the border status quo first, and breaking the agreements and important consensus between the two sides first. French President Emmanuel Macron met his Iraqi counterpart this Wednesday on his first official visit to Baghdad, where he insisted the war-scarred country should reassert its sovereignty despite simmering U.S.-Iran tensions. Arriving straight from a two-day trip to Lebanon, President Macron is the most prominent world leader to visit Iraq since Prime Minister Mustafa al-Kadhimi came to power in May. According to Macron, speaking on the final night of his visit to Beirut, the trip to Iraq aims to launch an initiative alongside the United Nations to support a process of sovereignty. In Baghdad, Macron voiced his support for his Iraqi counterpart, Baham Saleh, in the fight against the Islamic State and their assistance to foreign interference. Meanwhile, President Baham Saleh vowed that Iraq's sovereignty would be respected during a joint press conference with the French president in Baghdad. We do not want Iraq to be a conflict zone for others. However, we want others to participate in the stability of Iraq and have respect for its sovereignty. Preventing interference in its internal affairs is the basis for a common regional security in a way that guarantees the fulfillment of the aspirations of the region's people for development and prosperity.
Former Lebanese President Emile Lahoud announced on Wednesday that France is threatening national politicians with money deposited in lending institutions of the European country. During an interview with Pan-Arab TV channel Al Mayadeen, the former president, who led Lebanon from 1998 to 2007, stressed that Paris is seeking to pressure Lebanon to reach a peace deal with Israel, just as the United Arab Emirates recently did, and predicted that Saudi Arabia will do the same on Thursday. He explained that before the Lebanese popular uprising began on October 17th, French authorities intimidated the Lebanese political class with confiscating funds deposited abroad. This was evident in President Emmanuel Macron's statements when he threatened to impose sanctions on Lebanese authorities if they ignore the mandate to undertake reforms in the next three months. Money being given to Lebanon to help Lebanon. The Auditor General of South Africa released his first report on the multi-billion rand COVID-19 relief package and how it was spent by various government departments this Wednesday. According to the findings, there were clear signs of overpricing, unfair processes, potential fraud and supply chain management legislation being sidestepped in the management of the funds. The audit was undertaken on request of President Cyril Ramaphosa following allegations of corruption. So this was a multidisciplinary team effort that did not just rely on somebody delivering an invoice to you, but it relied on expertise that, is, that are able to go very deep into areas where, shall I say, eagles dare. This has resulted in illegal payments, amongst others, to recipients of the state grants, students receiving NASFAS payments, public servants, and uh, even UIF employees, and even inmates, deceased persons and uh, minors. There is also evidence of overpayments and underpayments as well as inflated claims. Tunisia's parliament has approved the country's third government in less than a year, following a 15-hour session that started on Tuesday. Former Interior Minister Hichem Michichi was confirmed as Prime Minister after his cabinet, dominated by technocrats, secured support from nearly two-thirds of the Chamber of Deputies overnight. The 46-year-old has pledged to revitalise a tourism-reliant economy that has been hit hard by the coronavirus pandemic and said after the vote that his government would be able to move forward, provided it was not bogged down with political tensions. Tunisia's parliament is deeply divided and many lawmakers were angry that Michichi bypassed the main political factions in building his cabinet. Authorities in Zimbabwe have launched an investigation over a suspected bacterial infection causing the death of elephants in western areas of the country. The Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority noted that more elephant carcasses had been found in the Pandamasu Forest, located between the Wange National Park and Victoria War Falls, bringing the number of elephants suspected to have been killed by a bacterial infection to 22. Spokesman Tinashi Faroe pointed out that most of the animals were young, with the oldest aged 18, while adding that more deaths are expected to occur. Meanwhile, ongoing investigations are set to establish whether or not there's a link between similar mysterious deaths in neighbouring Botswana, where 281 elephant carcasses were discovered in June this year. Zimbabwe has an elephant population of over 84,000. Um, we have discovered uh, more uh, dead bodies of, uh, of the elephants, which means we, are, we have now lost 22 from the aerial survey that we did uh, yesterday. Uh, more deaths are expected, but we will continue to monitor the situation. We will continue to do this aerial surveys, and we will continue to also do ground surveys. We are not only using um, the aerial survey, also making use of technology, the drones, to make sure that at least we know what is happening uh, on the ground. Our scientists are suspecting that there's a bacteria which is causing the death uh, of, of, of these animals. These things, they normally happen during this time of the year because of uh, food shortages mainly. Uh, the biggest problem that we have uh, is uh, the biggest threat in fact that we have for the survival of our animals is uh, loss of habitat. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many of the stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. You can also join us on social media on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss and thank you for watching.